Okay. Well, good afternoon. Um, I'm I'm open for your questions, or I can fill time. Thank you. So. <laughs> <laughs> but I but I'd rather answer what's on your mind. So I don't know who wants to. Should we just go around the table? Yeah. Sure. 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 Ladies first. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> You're by yourself on that side. <laughs> um, I know. Uh, just catching uh, from your talk a little bit ago. Okay. Uh, I missed the beginning of it, but later on you talked a little bit about IT training. Mm -hmm. um, and the pilot that was going, that started in January? Yes. So actually, um, so that's called, it's it's part of the CANES, the Consolidated Float Network Environment mm -hmm. System, CANES. Um, uh, and it's uh, called TVE. So CANES TVE is what it's known as. Um, tr uh, Training Virtual Environment, I, I do believe is what it stands for. Uh, PMW160 has been um, working working on that project. They're the Canes Program Manager. And um, it came out of a, of a need that we had, you know, the, the kind of normal way that we fielded training equipment, right, was to field the exact equipment to the schoolhouse. And that's kind of the historic way we've always done done work in the, in the Navy, you know. So when we were fielding Canes, we took a cane system and you know we did an install at the at the schoolhouse and um, it turns out when you do that and you're trying to modernize it's hard to um, keep up with the technology refresh rate on all the things when you're trying to modernize a fleet the same people installing there would have to go back and install in the schoolhouse and so uh, over time um, our our equipment that we were training our canes operators on um, became stale it you know it was out of sequence with the majority of the fleet. In fact, for the for the most part, um, the system that we were using, we were training sailors on um, in shift work to get the throughput on a system that they would go out to the fleet and whatever they would see in the fleet would not exactly be what what they would see. And so um, PMW one hundred and sixty um, took on that challenge, um, and we took some um, we took some. Uh, examples from some of the other enterprises uh, and one that comes to mind is the undersea warfare enterprise and so the submarine community um, as they were designing uh, future systems went to a more virtualized capability you know uh, develop a you know a set of virtual environments that could replicate what you would see but without having to mimic all the hardware and, and software stacks so pmw 160 um, uh, started down this path so so uh, canes tve um, the pilot uh, started in January. Um, I actually saw it demoed here this morning. Um, so you can, if you, Deloitte, I think it's the Deloitte uh, folks are, are doing it. I think they could actually, if you wanted to see it. Um, they just had a normal laptop, came up, were able to go into a virtualized environment. Um, they were able to log a student in. Uh, the, student, they, the student would select the version of hardware and software for their canes on their, their system on their ship or whatever they're training to. Um, it would go then, the instructor would set up the environment, it would send a, uh, a series of um, uh, instructions to the cloud, so, and, and it would be built, uh, a virtualized environment of all the servers that make up the, the cane stack would be then fed back um, you know, to the, to the uh, student's laptop and they would see the environment and it would, it would replicate and operate exactly like their version. And then the instructor can go from the behind and, you know, and do things and, and, and take them through the training. Take, it, take down the email server, this is how you get the information. So, you know, run them through the series um, to, get, to get it back up. All in virtual space. Um, as this unfolds into the, um, once the pilot's complete, this is how we'll do classroom training through the Center for Information Warfare Training. Um, that means that every student that goes through now will sit down at a, at, a, at a laptop, see the version that they will actually use out in the fleet, not not some generic version. And you could sit down a person with a Canes 1.0, 1.0 hardware software next to a kid that's going to a 2.0, 3.0 ship. And they can go through the same training, but on their version, look, feel, and replicate. Uh, that's what that was about. It's pretty exciting because we've not had that capability. Um, the other thing is we've piloted it out to um, some of our four or FDNF ships, so um, out in Japan and um, forward deployed naval force. Sorry, I'm trying not to use all the acronyms. Um, so uh, and so we've done. I think it's uh, I think it was on Ronald Reagan and Curtis Wilbur 
uh, peer side, and they were able to, you know, bring up their environment for their system with a facilitated instructor and, and, and do that kind of background training that they couldn't, couldn't do otherwise. So uh, significant step forward in that particular capability. Uh, but this idea of virtualized environments and, and how is the way that we are viewing the way forward for IW and how we, you know, can keep up with technology. Because if you can just build a software-defined version of the system, you know, it's much easier to drop in the stack and, you know, and, and keep going than going in and installing a whole new gadget, you know, gadget, so. How soon can you have this across the fleet? Um, I think it'll go pretty quickly. Um, it's, it's um, like I said, the CWIT training goes in place, I think, in July. Um, and then, you know, from there, it's, it's, it really becomes a matter of instructor. If you know, if you want instructor-led capability, you, you know, it's just a matter of, you know, scheduling and fielding, but um, I think it'll it'll go pretty quickly once we get from there. I don't know the exact plan for 160 and, and the schoolhouse, though, for rolling it completely out. I, I can find that out if you... And CNP is obviously working the CNP. The NETC, the, yeah, Naval Education Training Command, uh, Admiral Kozad, um, is, uh, that's who the Center for Information Warfare Training works for, uh, and this is all part of the, part of the, um, the plan that we have. Um, which will then lead into things like uh, um, uh, re ready relevant learning, right? It's part of the stack. Okay? Thank you. All right, great. Just to stick on training, I, I think what you were saying is one of the challenges is building a, tra a virtualized environment that operates on the low side for a system that lives so, on the high side. So, yeah. So, you know, in the Navy, right, or the mm -hmm. DOD, we operated on class level, we operated at a secret level, and we operated at a, at a top secret level. Much of the, much of the, um, much of the IW capability uh, when you start getting into um, um, signals and intelligence and other things ride up here at kind of a, a TS level. The fleet operates generally uh, at a secret level. You know, across, you know, when you're, when you're in a shipboard environment, most, most ship systems are operating. Um, to have a skiff with a TS capability or higher, if you, if you have that, requires, you know, special access and those kind of things, harder, harder to do. Um, we've got to be able, though, to natively be able to take data that's coming in on these higher, higher networks and be able to work the cross-domain piece in a seamless way that you can share information up and down. And there are ways is you can take off, you know, if you strip data off certain data pieces, you can th bring things, you know, down a level. Um, sources, sources, methods, those kind of things, you can strip those off and just have the, the actual actionable information. If you, if you're, if you, for example, are targeting something, you know, all you need to know about a target is a, is a certain number of things. You need to know, you know, where its location is, you know, in, uh, in space, and you need to make sure that you positively ID that. That information can be, you know, put into, a, into, a, into the targeting system at the secret level, even with stuff that's been produced at the higher level, by just stripping off that stuff and just passing down that basic information. In, in a training environment, though, you don't really need operational data, do you? So that, that's well, kind of, I'm that's talking, I'm, yeah, I'm so... I'm wondering why that's a challenge at all to... to, to well, because if you're going to do, if you're going to do live... So you can... Two aspects of it. You can, you can take everything down to a secret level for training. But if you want to actually use uh, in the live virtual con constructive uh, ability, you're actually using live systems so you know when we're when we're doing live virtual constructive um, training with a strike group um, you're getting you know and you're looking at whatever system X you're looking at you're seeing on your your particular display you're seeing information that's real and they're injecting other information in there to make it to make the battle space more complicated or provide different dilemmas or challenges for you, right? And so you can play a virtual strike group with a real strike group. And you, the other one, the, the aircraft, the ships, and other things may not actually be there, but your systems, when you're in the training mode, are there. What we want to be able to do is have the same um, ability from our electronic warfare and our signals intelligence and some of our other other systems that operate at this higher level to be able to stimulate down and for the down to stimulate 
up, if you, if you know what I mean. I want the operators that sit uh, in the electronics warfare or in the signals intelligence spaces to be able to natively see the same thing that, that the operators down, you know, running fire control are seeing, to stimulate thought, look for, look for signals, you know, those kind of things. And at the same time, all their information should be able to be pulled down into an ability to turn it into a target, if that makes sense. Yeah. So it's really, yes, you can, you can dumb down information in a training environment, you know, in a closed training environment. You can dumb it down and still get the same effects. But if you really want to do high-end training, you need to train on your own systems and be able to see that natively. And that cross-connection, uh, just needs. we just need to work through it. Yeah, the thing I was trying to figure out is, is it is the classification challenge operational data or threat data, or is it like the existence of the capability at all? Is that what's classified? Can't it can be both. It can be both. Okay. All right. Sir, you talked about Raven and kind of extending its use. Can you talk a little bit more about the plan for within Navifor? And then um, you mentioned, and Admiral Becker mentioned, um, the implementation of cyber dashboards with Raven. Right. Can you talk more about that? Uh, sure. Raven? So the, the beauty of, so when we started off with Raven, you know, the, the first thing we were really trying to get after was fixing this problem with um, the systems operation validation tests or the individual system installs or how you test all the systems together, right? We were trying to get after why, why, were, why were the SOVOTs, the individual system tests, why were they being delayed? Why couldn't we get them done on time? Because when they didn't get done on time, then your systems of systems things didn't get done on time and then you'd end up with a ship ready to train in all aspects except for the modernized gear that didn't make it through the process, right? And that's, a, that's not a good place to start because it just snowballs from there. So we were really trying to get after um, authoritative data sources. So, you know, things like, um, you know, sparing information, personnel information, uh, casualty reports, those kind of things. Get those authoritative sources to kind of figure out that little piece. Well, once we started on that, that, that process um, and, and connected up all these, like there's about 30 of them across all the man, train, and equip pillars. Um, when, by the time we connected them all and started trying to pull data out, when you, when you have data and you can use something like Tableau to help you on the, on the, to visualize, um, we started seeing things in the data that, that we didn't recognize before. We started to see a, a larger potential for how to use um, what was originally, I think, designed really to ferret out the SOVOT SOT process was, was extended. Um, I believe that I could use um, uh, the, the Raven data to help me understand the manning, training, equipping, material readiness of all the shore commands that I have administrative control of in a way that you know now we manually roll up and have to manually go into different databases and pull out and kind of subject. I think there's a. I think we will be able to get after that by connecting different portions of this data lake that we've developed uh, in a user-defined way to, to pull out readiness. So I can look at a, a communication station or a fleet weather center, and I can understand where their, what, what their manpower looks like in terms of readiness. Um, we can get, uh, um, I can look at their equipping status and CAS reps and other things. You know, just get a, a, a more real-time um, update on readiness without having to resort to the ways we do it now, which is really manual. And so there's a, there's a huge, I think, time and labor aspect to this to get after things which humans do better than just, you know, humans are good at manual data entry, but if a computer can do it better for you, uh, we can use humans to do the things they're really good at. So I think that's, from, that's, that's where I'm going. Specifically to cyber dashboards, we, we were asked um, many years ago, it's been, a, it's been a few years, we were asked many years ago by the, the fleet to develop uh, individual um, cyber dashboards, if you will, for um, our fleet units, right? It's a very, very small uh, focused effort. Um, this would tell you everything about a, a, an individual ship, it would tell you about their network and what their patch levels were and you know how, how often they ran their scans and you know those kind of things. That's what you're looking for in, in, in terms of in terms of overall readiness. Um, we hired contractors support and it was all very manual. 
So this was, you know, this was one of those ones where you were scraping out, the, you know, off different reports and putting these things together. And it took us essentially about a month of effort. This is in the past. It took us about a month of effort to put that all together to turn around the hand of the fleet so that they could see it. So you could just see the, you know, and, and that was the that was the state of the art of what we could do at that point. Um, by developing the Raven aspect of it, um, because of the way that we pull data in, um, it had all the essential elements of all what we needed to do the dashboard. And so we've reduced that time down to a couple, a, a day or so um, by setting things up and running it. Um, the CNOs ask us to, to be broader in that view of, of cyber dashboards, so all commanders. So while we were focused at the ships, um, this is all, so this is shore side, other side. Well, it's actually not that hard because the data is all in these different data sources that we have. And so that's kind of where we're heading. And what we want to be able to do is develop it out so the end user can go in and, you know, define how they want to see the dashboard, you know, and the things that are important to the commander. So that's kind of where we're heading with the dashboard effort. Any timeline for that second part? or? Um, I or? think we're, so... Um, the second part really, you know, like anything else, <laughs> we have to go through the go through the risk management framework, and we have to get our authority to operate um, software on the system, right? So there's a server involved that pulls the data, you know, the data in and creates the data lake, and so that's all going through the the normal um, approval processes. So I think we're within a couple months of uh, of having that done, and then at that point we'll be able to go. Um, if you will, live on the user-defined aspect of how that will work. Um, so within a couple of months, uh, I hate to give you an exact date because right, nobody's no, nobody's given me exact date no, yet. No, that's but, fine. Uh, I just want was to yeah. the ballpark. That's perfect. Thank but you. we can produce those now. Just there's some manual intervention, right? That you and and, and and defined. And what we do now is they're produced. They go out to a they go out to like a SharePoint site, and then the, the units can pull them off and, and use them. But in the future, they'll be able to pull them more directly. You spoke briefly about some of the challenges with space and cyber, particularly to IW, and, and I know you were talking, I think, particularly about billets. But are there broader challenges that you really need to work through? Yeah. To make, and I, I think you were, I think you just touched on briefly, but to get space to fit into the yeah, broader I'll, IW. Yeah. So, enterprise. so my perspective, I tell you, my, my main perspective. If I give you a talking point here, um, when as we've evolved into this new strategy, and we look at uh, what our, our near peer competitors are doing uh, in, in uh, across the board in information warfare. Um, as we as I look at that, um, we've got to evolve. We've got to evolve from a, uh, a culture in the Navy that thinks of information warfare capabilities as enablers to th to thinking about them as part of the warfighting fabric. Right. Um, we've got to get them to think about them natively. In their in their planning, not as the after thought after they've put all their plans together, um, and then go oh we've got to bring space and cyber into this what's that mean and try to bolt it on. Um, all warfare areas take careful planning and orchestration, right? And we're really good at it from the kinetic side. We know how to posture forces. We know how to do things well from the kinetic side of the house. Um, the space and the cyber aspects of things have a different set of authorities um, that are that take a little more uh, pre-planning and thought not, than just kind of throwing it in last minute. We've got to get that natively into the planning cycle where, where um, fleet operators and commanders in the field are thinking about those things uh, from the get-go. Um, with our near-peer adversaries, it comes down, and a lot of times it comes down to their our ability to do intelligence surveillance and reconnaissance, our eyes and ears, versus their ability to take that away, right? The counter sequence. So there's this always tension there. How do we protect, how do we be better at our own capability of understanding the situation, and how do we prevent them from, from taking it away from us? And those take a lot of planning and integration from an information warfare perspective. I'm a I'm a oceanographer by trade. If you look at my bio, you. I'd probably go, what's an oceanographer doing in talking cyber? Um, but I, I often go back to my roots as, a, as an oceanographer. When I started off um, 
you know, when I started off into, in, into the, the community, I had come from the surface warfare community. I'd ridden, ridden around on probably the roughest riding ship in the Navy, an LST, a tank landing ship, uh, or as we called, long, slow target. <laughs> um, but it, 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 was, uh, it was 300 feet long, it had 600,000 gallons of diesel fuel and a flat bottom. <laughs> and it was never going to roll over, but it sure did roll. And you know, when you're, when you're normal underway and normal seas was 15, 20 degrees, and you were slapping back and forth, you know, I learned a thing or two about understanding the weather. And then I carried that with me into the, into the oceanography community. Um, I would say today, if you, if you think about what you do in the course of just your normal life, and you're going to go do something in the course of your day, you're going to look at the weather almost every day. Um, and you have all kinds of access to it. And you go and you use things like probabilities that you don't even think about. Probability it's going to rain, you know, these kind of things. You make decisions every day, right, just inherent to the, the way you operate um, based on those kind of those things. 20% rain, you're going to go do it. Because you, you want to golf, you're going to go. 80% rain, you might do something else. You know, you just... And, and we do that same kind of thing in the, in the Navy um, and in the, the Marine Corps as well, in the Naval Force. We think about that kind of in our planning. What's the, what's the environment going to be like? I, I, I look forward to a day that information warfare across its entire portfolio is, is thought of in the same way. What's my cyber environment? What's my space environment? As natively as we think about what's my physical maritime environment. Um, that's going to take two things. And, I, and, and one of them is... We need to raise just the, the level of understanding of how this all works and demystify it uh, in both the space and cyber aspects. We have to demystify it. We tend to talk in, in different language that's not, you know, not normalized to the na rest of the Navy. And so um, we've got things underway um, uh, within Naval Information Forces, for example. We have a, a mobile team trainer that we operate that uh, for, for to normalize Navy space, Navy Space Operations course, but to normalize the fleet, we don't just teach it to space professionals. We we go from strike group to ARG, and you know, and, and we're tr we're tr raising the knowledge level of space. Um, we need to do the same thing in, in the cyber. In fact, the CNO um, is focused on that as well. And so, I think our our big pull across this area is to kind of raise the floor of the entire fleet normalize information warfare into the warfighting engine of the fleet and, and not be thought of as the bolt-on capability, but as an intricate part of what we do. So big piece for Naval Information Forces as the IW lead working with the other, with the other type commanders to kind of in, inculcate that into the Navy, uh, Navy mission area. Um, it's good to have the CNO because that's the way that the CNO is thinking as well uh, with his background, both as a service warfare officer and in the cyber realm. Um, and so I think those, you'll see a lot of momentum in that as the Navy kind of normalizes it. So we're at time. Okay. All right. And it normalizes that? You mentioned the IW commander. In terms of raising that. Well, the IW, the IW commander is very specific to what we do, but I'm, you know, he needs, he needs the rest of the fleet to be it, kind of understand what he's saying, he or she, you know, out of You don't think the message is getting across? Um, I think it is at the high levels, um, but you know we see. I see signs of it. You know, when I was in talking at the at the TICOM, uh, the natural the natural questions always went to the kinetic side. You know, they kind of they kind of drift always, and that's a that's. I think you know, in a couple of years when you come here and you sit down the IW panel, I think a lot of the more will be focused on the IW part of what we're what we're doing. It's just you know everybody is getting used to this uh, kind of normalization of IW into the. It's a culture aspect. It's, it is. Uh, young kids are much more, you know, I've seen it over time. They're much more apt to, to take this on holistically. So, uh, Very excited community of young professionals out there, uh, which, you know, charges me up every day. So um, uh, we've made a lot of progress. And, in, in, you know, while we've been a community for, you know, 10 years, if you start with the IDC, um, where we were 10 years ago and where we are to now is night and day different. And... Um, and, uh, you know, see what, just see where we'll be in 10 years, you know, we'll, it's going to be a completely different environment, it, especially when IW is going to become the central, I, I believe, the central part of the strike group, you know, so. All right. Okay, thanks, guys. Thanks, Thank sir. You for your time, I appreciate sir. it. Thank you.